Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters, welcome back to a very exciting episode. Joining me is Mark Nevitt, a law professor at Emory University. Mark and I discuss the legal challenges posed by climate change and the uncertainties that policymakers and property owners face in deciding whether to invest in climate adaptation. As climate change destabilizes the physical environment, legal doctrine is ripe for destabilization too. U.S. laws were created during a much more stable climate, which makes it difficult to address the unpredictable nature of climate impacts. Mark and I also dig into the role of the judiciary in climate decisions and if climate skepticism should be a disqualifying factor for a judge weighing in on these issues. We'll also hear a bit more about Mark's experiences as a fighter pilot with the U.S. Navy, a first for this podcast. Okay, upcoming episodes. I traveled to Trinidad and Tobago to record a podcast for the Keeping History Above Water Conference. It was a fantastic experience discovering how that island and other islands in the region will adapt to a changing climate. I also went to Columbus, Ohio to interview speakers and attendees at Battelle's Innovations and Climate Resilience Conference. What a great time. I got to meet quite a few listeners and previous guests on the show. Stay tuned for those episodes. But before we get started, I wanted to share... Legendary Academy Award winning director Oliver Stone is back with Nuclear Now, his first film in seven years, coming exclusively to theaters across the USA and Canada beginning April 28th. Based on the book A Bright Future, written by award winning scholar of international relations, Professor Joshua S. Goldstein, who also co wrote the film, Nuclear Now explores the possibility for the global community to overcome the challenges of climate change and energy poverty to reach a more optimistic future through the power of nuclear energy, an option that may become increasingly important in the critical years ahead. With unprecedented access to the nuclear industry in France, Russia, and the United States, director Oliver Stone delivers a revolutionary documentary that Variety has called an intensely compelling must-see film. The movie opens in New York and Los Angeles on April 28th with special one-day screening events across North America on Nuclear Now Day, May 1st, that you won't want to miss. Visit NuclearNowFilm.com to learn more. Okay, let's join Mark Nevitt and learn how the legal system will adapt to climate change. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very exciting episode. Joining me is Mark Nevitt. Mark is an associate professor of law at Emory University School of Law in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hi, Doug. Great to be on your show. Looking forward to this. This was a very frustrating episode in the sense of preparing for this episode. You gave me a lot of homework and I wanted to, there could have been 10 episodes around the different topics that you're covering. And so it was the challenge for me to distill this down. Hopefully we're going to have this great conversation and I just want to throw that out there and also want to throw out, I'm not a lawyer. I think I'm a relatively smart guy, but of course, you know, a lot of my listeners, just the idea of technical terms or the the notion of really understanding the law, just pretend like you're talking to a somewhat informed person. But, you know, I I don't really know the laws maybe as well as I think I do. And so just keep that in mind in in your, your answers. I'm just prepping that. But let's just get started with what kind of law do you teach? Sure. So I just taught, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Doug. I've been a longtime admirer of America Adapts, and it's been very generative to my work here at Emory Law School in Atlanta. And you should know that some of the America Adapts podcasts have made it into my syllabi. So awesome. uh, I teach environmental law. I just taught environmental law class today, as well as climate change law and policy class, which is an into this very course here at Emory, looking at science, law, policy. I also teach constitutional law. My background is from the U.S. Navy, which is where I get interested in the issue of climate change and climate security. So I stay involved in the national security space as well. All right. You jumped the gun a little bit there, but you do have a fascinating background. Let's elaborate on that a bit more because there you are at Emory, but it's been sort of a long journey. I mean, that military background. Walk us through that a little bit. I mean, just somewhat briefly, but just walk us a bit more how, how you got to where you're at. Sure. Well, so I'm a proud uh, third generation veteran of the U.S. military. And so I was a naval officer for, for 20 years following my commission from the University of Pennsylvania. And within the Navy, I sort of had a few careers within the Navy. The first part was I flew Navy jets off aircraft carriers for the first six, seven years of my time in the Navy. That was a lot of fun, especially when you're in your 20s and you're invincible. And then became a lawyer, what's called military JAG lawyer in the, in the U.S. Navy. And I did a whole host of issues or legal practice in the Navy JAG Corps, 
focusing most recently towards the end on environmental law issues and climate change issues. From there, I left the Navy, very difficult decision to leave the Navy at 20 years uh, of service. And then I went down into the academic world and I've been teaching here at Emory actually since the summer of 22, but I've taught at University of Pennsylvania Law School, Syracuse and the U.S. Naval Academy following my, my Naval service. All right. This is total side question, but it just occurred to me. There was that TV show called JAG. Did they ever cover climate change in any of their episodes? Do you know? <laughs> no, they didn't, Doug. But okay. I will say when I, I left my squadron uh, to go to law school, all my aviator and pilot friends just shook their head at me and said, why would you want to be a lawyer when you have the greatest job in the world flying with us? And it was a lot of fun, but I wanted to do something a little bit different in the Navy. Okay, now let's get into the weeds here. You've written a paper, and this is why we got started with this conversation in the first place. And, and correct me if I get it wrong and maybe just tell where it's at, but yeah, the legal crisis within the climate crisis. That's a new paper out. Where is it at? So this paper is forthcoming in a law review, the Stanford Law Review, and it'll be coming out in the next year or so, uh, but it is available. It's on draft right now on an academic website, which I'll, I'm sure you'll put in the show notes so a 75-page paper that I'm working on edits right now, but it's forthcoming in the Stanford Law Review in the next year or so. All right. 75 pages. And I'll be honest, I've gone through a lot of it. I, God, boy, that's just, it's dense material. And that's where I would go down these rabbit holes. I will have the that paper in my show notes so people can look at it. And there's it's broken down really nicely into different sections if you just have curiosities about these different areas. And I want to talk a little bit, some of the details. We're not going to go kind of section by section. First off, just what's been the response to it? So it has been accessible to people. And I, you, I think you'd mentioned earlier that, well, before that, it's been pretty popular response. The, the response has been pretty popular, and I've gotten some feedback already since I, I posted it and I tweeted it out a few weeks ago. And I think it's forcing people to look at the climate adaptation challenge, which a lot of your listeners are exposed to from a policy standpoint. And, and this paper sort of looks at, okay, where the rubber meets the road, where are the legal sticking points, where are the legal questions where are the constitutional questions, where are the legal challenges? Because we look to adapt, we may have a lot of really good ideas, but if we can't do it in a legal way or a way that can be operationalized in accordance with the law, it's going to be challenging. And so the work of this paper essentially is saying we have a whole set of doctrines, laws, statutes that were designed for a much more stable time, but climate change is going to be massively destabilizing as we look to adapt. Legal doctrine, legal statutes have to adapt with it. Okay. And so again, we're not going to cover everything, but I think what's really important is that you make a point that there are four adaptation tools that policymakers are considering in response to climate change. So what are they? Sure. And this is, you can slice or dice it any way you want it, Doug, but I, I, I highlight four in the paper, resistance, accommodation, retreat, which can come in either a managed retreat format or an unmanaged retreat format. We've defaulted to the latter, which is I call unmanaged retreat. So resistance is just the traditional building seawalls, armoring. It can even be eminent domain steps in, a, in the coastal zones. That runs into a, a challenge with the Fifth Amendment. Accommodation is a regulation. It could be a no-build zone or just coastal zone adaptation regulations in the coastal zone. But that too has some challenges based upon how the Fifth Amendment is applied in the coastal zone. And then retreat, I think that we need to start thinking about managed retreat and have it in a voluntary manner. But we sort of defaulted to this fourth adaptation strategy, which I which I use that in ear quotes if you're if we're seeing me talk, which is essentially unmanaged retreat, which is sort of ad hoc, disjointed, which is often what happens following a natural disaster. So those are my four typologies I walk through in the paper. And frankly, each one has really significant legal or policy challenges associated with implementing them. Again, this is related to the paper. How can policymakers balance the legal uncertainties and complexities with the urgent need to address the impacts of climate change on property owners and communities? First and foremost, I think that legal legislators, policymakers have to be upfront in just the risks or associated with issues in the climate zone. Oftentimes, it's actually relatively opaque to know what we're buying into for a homeowner or even a renter in a, in a climate coastal zone. I just say in the paper, I use coastal zone as a touch point, but some of these adaptation issues are also relevant to the wildfire urban interface. I, I think that policymakers need to be upfront in disclosing the risks. And they also need to start integrating and start taking forward-looking adaptation measures and regulations to start preparing for the what I view as a climate destabilized future. 
this is really interesting to me because I think we all have a different definition of being property owners in the United States. This is just so sacrosanct and to, to, to my chagrin, I have a home and then I do appreciate all the rights that are associated with it. But I, I kind of look at property ownership as almost sort of more a sophisticated renter. You know, you still have responsibilities. Does the current legal system prioritize the interest of property owners over the public interest when you think about climate change? I think the, the short answer to your question is yes, particularly in, in the United States. And that's due to the Fifth Amendment. And your, and your listeners may be familiar with the Fifth Amendment's taking clause, which is just 12 words, which have huge, huge, huge implications for climate change and climate adaptation. The Fifth Amendment takings clause says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And so there are three aspects of that clause, which I think are really, really important for climate change and climate adaptation measures. The first is that that includes physical takings. So if you were to place an armoring or seawall on a private property, you have to provide just compensation to that private homeowner. The second piece of it is that this Takings clause applies to regulations as well. That surprises people. There's a whole doctrine of regulatory taking. So if a coastal zone piece of legislation has a law that goes too far and it impacts a property owner's investment back expectations, then that, that can also trigger a taking requiring just compensation. So that's the second piece of the takings clause, which has been expanded in recent in, in the last hundred years or so. And, and the final point, Doug, I'll, I'll say is that this is not just federal action. This applies to state, local, city action. And so that's known as the incorporation doctrine within U.S. constitutional law. So we have the takings clause. It's been around since 1789. But because of this sort of doctrinal expansion of the last hundred years or so, it also applies to regulations, also applies to all forms of government. And the upshot is that that's something that each and every municipality and locality needs to be aware of before they pass regulation or before they have some sort of physical invasion of another person's property. All right. There are all these great nuggets within the paper. And there was a section where you, you, I don't know if you're actually suggesting or encouraging, but the need for a federal climate adaptation plan. And I've actually done an episode with the author of a bill. It hasn't passed and it hasn't happened, but there's obviously a lot of interest. And you'd mentioned the, this idea of critical climate zones that could help some of these legal discussions. Could you explain a little bit of that? Sure. So the, the other sort of key constitutional provision, Doug, that I would highlight beyond the Fifth Amendment that is your listeners should just be aware of is the Tenth Amendment, which says essentially that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution being the federal government, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states or to the people. So state, local governments really are at the front lines of climate adaptation under just the 10th Amendment, because we don't have some plenary federal land use law applying to all the adaptation. But I do think that there could be some sort of national climate adaptation plan discussion of a that discusses critical climate zones, which provides some information to prospective buyers, to, to existing homeowners that really showcases the climate risks that, that are there. Right now, we're seeing a lot of that being done by sort of third parties like real estate and other firms like that trying to get at that. But I think the federal government does have a role in, in helping showcase and shining light on climate risk. And again, in the paper, there's so many of the examples, case studies, and previous, I guess, decisions that were made. I mean, it all comes down to these local government decisions. Can you talk about some of the potential conflicts that exist between, and you sort of, I think you just identified some of that there, but between federal and state law, and then there's even local government policies. I mean, that must be constantly butting up against each other. Sure. So we see the federal law really come in through like three different statutes that your listeners are, are familiar with. And that comes down to sort of information sharing and, and funding and how we fund some of our development and oftentimes critical climate zones. The first is the Stafford Act, which is how we, which is the Federal Stafford Act, which is essentially how we respond to emergencies or major disasters and climate change will will have an increase in that over the time period. But what that that does, I think, too often, Doug, is we have this pattern of destroy, rebuild, repeat. And there's some examples in the paper where I talk about there's homes in, that have been destroyed numerous times that have been federally bailed out based upon provisions in the Stafford Act and how FEMA allocates money following the natural disaster. So that's the first sort of federal law that has a role. Again, it's not an adaptation plan, but it has a, a key role. 
The second, of course, is the national flood insurance policy, which I think subsidizes building in the coastal zone through the provision of subsidized flood insurance. And the third is the Privacy Act, which doesn't get enough attention as it probably should, but that protects certain laws or or certain records for past flooding from being uh, provided to prospective homeowners as a protective record under the Privacy Act's interpretation. And so that's sort of where the federal government is involved is those sort of three key roles. Absent that state and local governments, they, they control the show, right, for adaptation. You have this really interesting federalism system where you have these statutes, which are oftentimes not disclosing climate risk or even incentivizing risk in the, in the critical zone. And then you have state and local governments, which are trying to sort of manage our adaptation future. You sort of answered it, but I want to keep digging. And are there any particular legal doctrines or statutes that you believe need to be updated or amended to deal with climate change? And I just, I immediately kind of go to things like NEPA, and I don't know if that's even necessarily relevant, but it's that big environmental law. It's this assessment, and it forces a lot of local governments to start thinking about the environmental impact. But I mean, just where can we start? Sure. So I think that we could maybe start with the Stafford Act that has some pre-hazard mitigation provisions that are there. And there's been some updates to the Stafford Act that we should build upon. So it's not just reactive, it's more more proactive. You mentioned the National Environmental Policy Act, a really key key law. I don't know if there, that really is something that for climate adaptation is, needs to be looked at again, but when you certainly are looking at climate mitigation and these massive renewable energy projects or things along those lines, there has to be an environmental impact statement for massive solar farms or wind farms, some along those lines. So NEPA, in, a, in an odd way, could actually be <laughs> undermining some of those climate hmm. climate efforts. So I think the Stafford Act should be looked at. I think the Privacy Act should be looked at. The National Flood Insurance Policy Program should be looked at as well. I also think that just the doctrine that we have sort of interpreting the Fifth Amendment, which is really a lot of the focus of the paper, needs to be looked at with fresh eyes. Because what I'm concerned about is that it could have a chilling effect, just the fear of litigation or the fear that the state or local government could be running a check to homeowners based upon a regulation, which is based upon the climate science in a coastal zone that could actually put taxpayers on the hook for compensating private homeowners. And so right now, I think that the law has not kept up with sort of our climate moment. That's one of the key takeaways from the papers that we have these doctrines that have worked, Doug, relatively well for a stable physical environment. I don't think they're ready for our climate destabilized future. All right. Much of the paper focuses on coastal zones, but you do touch upon like wildfire zones. And I even think of riverine flood zones, which, you know, that gets I don't think that gets enough attention. When you think about maybe these reforms to the legal system, are you going to have to just develop all new ones for each climate impact? I mean, how does that because you because let's say there'll be some precedent set, like when you're thinking a ruling on a like a sea level rise decision, it's about dealing guess, with that particular land. And, and are we going to have to just come up with a new system for each of these impacts? I think that we will have to think about the relationship between private property rights and regulation writ large. And I think that applies whether it be a coastal zone or a wildfire zone or, or something that we want to adapt to. And I think that one of the issues that comes out of the paper, I think, is this notion of regulatory taking. So we've expanded this physical takings to uh, include not just the physical taking of private property, but also the regulation of private property. And so if you have these sort of critical climate zones that you really don't want to build there anymore, it could be in the aftermath of a wildfire, or it could be a coastal barrier island. If you were to pass a regulation which would prohibit building, you know, existing homeowners and landowners are going to sue. And under the doctrine, there's a case I talk about in there called Lucas, where if there's no ability to achieve economic beneficial use of that of that property following the, the regulation, then the state and local government is going to be on the hook for compensating that landowner. And so these doctrines in particular, the regulatory takings doctrine, I think are germane to or they apply to whatever the climate impact may be. But we need to sort of look start looking at that with fresh eyes. 
it's distinctly possible when I, I was reading the paper, I just misinterpreted some of the things that you're saying there, especially with some of the, the I guess, the rulings that come down. But it got me thinking, I like talking hypotheticals here. You talk about homeowners willing to live with risk, let's say in the coastal zone, and somehow, and in some ways that absolves the local government if it, there's this, everyone's sort of aware of what's going on. And it's like, okay, they're going to live in this coastal zone. They were made aware of the risk. That, and so the local government's not responsible for a whole bunch of things that they're, they're generally responsible for. And it just got me th- thinking like, let's say in Florida, it's like, okay, well, you know, they're on their own, but it's never like that. And and I especially think like the insurance market in Florida. So even though, all right, these insurance companies are not going to insure these coastal homes, then it's even the inland homeowners are subsidizing it indirectly or through the citizens insurance. And so they're not really just taking responsibility on their own if they're living in this really dangerous area. Now, did I interpret that right in the first place? I think that's fair. And I think that this gets to this notion of notice, which oftentimes we don't have complete information about climate risk. And one of the points of the paper I'm arguing is that at at a minimum, we need to have a baseline understanding of the climate risk that homeowners are are facing. And I think that could impact this investment back expectations, which is a very critical legal term, which govern whether or not a regulatory taking has, has occurred. But there's a lot in your question and your point about just all the good information that can flow from providing notice requirements and not just potentially helping out in a legal challenge. It also sort of highlights sort of this real challenge that we have because so many of the interested homeowners and real estate and municipalities, they don't want people to leave their their, their coastal zone. They're incentivized to not highlight necessarily all the climate risks associated with the, the coastal zone. So I think we need to embrace what I call adaptation realism in the paper, where we need to sort of get need to get real about adaptation, the challenges before us, and start thinking big picture rather than sort of short term fiscal fears or or fears that leaving the coastal zone will start draining the municipal coffers. What I thought was really interesting, and in you, you talked about, th- there's just the flip side to legal liability for local governments. If they're not doing enough, they could be liable. If they're not, if they're doing things, they could be liable. And talk about, I think about five hundred million dollars have been invested in Miami. They're trying to be proactive. They're trying to do the responsible thing. But you make the point that they actually might be putting themselves on in sort of legal jeopardy by assuming those responsibilities. Did I read that right? Right. And this is sort of an open question, and uh, sort of you, you did that read, read that right, Doug. And, and essentially the government under some case law doesn't have an affirmative duty to protect private property unless they have taken on a obligation to to do so. And if you were to take on an adaptation, and Miami, I believe is 500 million of adaptation, there is some some case law that suggests that the, the private property owners are going to expect the city of Miami to maintain those adaptation measures for some period of time. And the the case law on this is a bit mixed, to be fair, but there's some laws out there or some case law out there that suggests that failure to reasonably maintain roads or infrastructure could actually impose some sort of legal obligation or a legal duty to the local locality or city. So in the city of Miami, I think what they're doing is really important, but I also think that they could change the relationship between the private property owners and the government in the sense that, generally speaking, there's no legal obligation for the city of Miami to to safeguard its citizens through infrastructure. But once the infrastructure is put in place, that relationship changes. And so that's just something we need to think through. And I have a little bit of discussion of that in the paper. That's something I want to build out in the future. I just had an episode talking about climate equity and there's been uneven results, but there's been a lot of attention to do more to environmental justice, climate justice. And you think about climate adaptation measures and how the, they could disproportionately impact low income communities and minority communities. You could talk about that a bit. How do we help with the legal system in, as we're trying to think of reform that they're not necessarily going to be impacted negatively again and again? Right. I think on a general matter, I, I, I listen to the climate equity podcast and, and I agree with the professor, a lot of his themes. I think from, from my standpoint, it's a lot about how do you actualize, how do you operationalize your, your legal rights? Oftentimes, the people who have access to lawyers, access to fight for the legal rights are going to be the wealthiest people, right? Who have the resources, have the baseline of knowledge, who have the wealthiest 
amount of property to to protect. And so there's a core aspect of aspect of, of access to to justice, Doug, which I think is sort of in the background of this of this conversation, which is to say that we have these laws that protect private property rights. And if you're a poor owner, a community of color, and, you, and you're less likely to operationalize that with access to, to legal services, then you're not going to be able to, to fight for your rights. And so the wealthier homeowners, many of them on very affluent islands and affluent uh, parts of the country are more likely to do that. So there's a, there's a core access to justice question, I think, that that is here. And one of the cases I used was the old A1A, which is the access road in, in Florida where litigants sued. And, and these homes are worth millions and millions of dollars. Once the the county decided not to maintain and upgrade this particular road, the homeowners relatively affluent access to lawyers and they and they fought for the rights and they were able to make some progress in that stance. But but I, I wonder about other communities that may not fully understand their rights or may not have access to lawyers in the same way. The Washington Post has been doing some great c- climate coverage. And just today, they had a story about another home on the outer banks of North Carolina that just fell into the ocean and all the struggles there. And yeah, I'm glad they're focusing on sea level rise. And I'm sure it's fascinating for you to hear what the, those struggles that are going on with those communities. But it's like, it was the fourth home and it's only fourth. And think about low income communities that are being impacted in, in really terrible ways. And all this attention on these really expensive homes right there on the coast. And it really is not some high volume thing. Not that it's not a tragedy for that particular family, but just the attention that th- these people get, it's there, there it is, you know, it's, it comes, shows up in the media too. Yeah, you're exactly right. I've been following this story very closely and, and I use the Outer Banks in North Carolina throughout the paper as an example of this as well, Doug. So, but there's a lot of communities who are not on the front page of the Washington Post that are facing similar problems, and even worse problems. You do a lot of speculating in the paper, which I love, and I just like having hypotheticals when it comes to climate change. And I was thinking, like, you're in a coastal community, and they're doing the responsible thing and doing an adaptation plan. And you talk about climate models and the modeling, and it is getting more sophisticated. And they're really getting down to some really regional level data and remains to be seen how accurate it is when it comes to planning. But it seems to be getting more accurate. And I wonder if a, a legal situation where there's an adaptation plan and they use some very sophisticated climate model to make decisions about where development's going to occur or development's not going to occur. Is that going to leave them liable, especially if these, I just had this discussion with Eric Rostin from Bloomberg News about climate models because he's covered it quite a bit that, okay, well, they were wrong with these projections and that impacted people making money, building homes, couldn't build a home, or they were actually building a home in in an area that the local government said wasn't going to be impacted. And it was, I mean, it's just, it's ripe for (laughs) just lawsuits, right? Sure. I mean, this this is a full litigation opportunity, uh, regardless of what what side you're on. So I, I think I come down the paper that it's important that states and localities start integrating the best available climate science into their adaptation plan. And I base that on a couple of reasons. One is it's the right thing to do from just a common sense perspective, plan for the future and take into account the best available climate science. I also think it could help thwart some of these litigation challenges. And, and I say that because if a regulation is based upon the ba- the best available climate science, there's some legal basis to argue that that is a sound regulation that is designed to protect the citizenry, protect the health and safety of that local community. And under this test that I, I talk about in the paper called the Penn Central test, that gets at the nature and character of the particular regulation and the purpose of the underlying regulation, which courts are more likely to defer to the legislature, defer to the policymakers if they're regulating the coastal zone for good faith reasons that are based on protecting the health, welfare, and safety of the community. That's not absolute, Doug, but I think you have to sort of make your wins where you can based upon this antiquated doctrine. So I think that be upfront about why you're regulating, about what's the basis for this particular regulation that can only help that local community. Hey, Adapters, we'll be right back with Mark, but want to share again, legendary Academy Award winning director Oliver Stone is back with Nuclear Now, his first film in seven years, coming exclusively to theaters across the USA and Canada beginning April 28th, based on the book A Bright Future, written 
by award-winning scholar of international relations, Professor Joshua S. Goldstein, who also co-wrote the film. Nuclear Now explores the possibility for the global community to overcome the challenges of climate change and energy poverty to reach a more optimistic future through the power of nuclear energy, an option that may become increasingly important in the critical years ahead. With unprecedented access to the nuclear industry in France, Russia, and the United States, director Oliver Stone delivers a revolutionary documentary that Variety has called an intensely compelling must-see film. The movie opens in New York and Los Angeles on April 28th with special one-day screening events across North America on Nuclear Now Day, May 1st, that you won't want to miss. Visit NuclearNowFilm.com to learn more. Okay, let's get back to Mark. We are going to do a major pivot here, but it's very important too. Is let's say they start passing some really useful laws, and you're like, okay, they're starting to get this policymakers and such. That's not where the law ends. It's how these laws are interpreted, and we have to think about the judiciary. And it immediately just comes to my mind. You hear all the different. There's judge, local judges. There's federal judges. There's the Supreme Court, and I want to talk a bit about that. And I guess I'll just start off with a simple question. You look at the judge landscape out there making these decisions. Are they equipped to handle these climate change questions? That's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I think that the climate change is not something that is really front and center of a lot of this adaptation litigation that judges turn to. But that's changing a little bit too, Doug. We're, seeing, we're starting to see a little bit of that in some judicial interpretations, not necessarily at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court has been really focused more on, on climate mitigation, West Virginia versus EPA, and of course, Massachusetts versus EPA, which gets at the authority of the Clean Air Act. But we're starting to see, I think, more and more uh, judges, the trend line it, starting to wrestle with climate impacts and, and climate change writ large. But there, I think there is a little bit of a disconnect because the doctrine hasn't, again, hasn't kept up with I think the threat before us. All right, I'm going to get to some Supreme Court questions, but there's this notion of even recusing yourself from a decision because we, we just make a lot of assumptions. Like you can't expect a judge to be an expert about all the science that comes before them. They just can't do it. That's not what you necessarily go to school for to be a judge and be a lawyer, I guess, starting off. But let's just say, because there's different levels of judgeships that you know a particular judge is not only skeptical, but he just doesn't really necessarily think climate change is real. I mean, is that a situation where that judge should recuse themselves from making a decision? Because if you're just everything that your interpretation, your reading of the law in relation to climate change, if your fundamental belief is that it doesn't even exist, that's a problem. I, I, that certainly is is a problem. I don't know about the judicial ethics associated with that. I'd be it seems unlikely that a at least a federal judge would recuse himself or, or herself. I don't know of any open climate deniers on the federal judiciary. I know some more climate skeptics, and we saw that in very famous cases that I talk about in the paper. Justice Scalia was a little bit more skeptical of climate change, and you see that a little bit in his reasoning in the Lucas decision, which is an important coastal zone adaptation case in South Carolina, and as well as Massachusetts versus EPA, where he grills the council about some of the climate science. So, But I can't see judicially, ethically, a federal judge recusing himself or, or herself in that situation. I'm not aware of any open climate deniers in the federal judiciary, but I may be missing something. Well, I bet in the last 10, 20 years, they just make sure that point is not well known, but it could be true. And it just, it, I guess my point though, is you, I think of all the points that you make in, in your paper, there's a lot of complex things that your future projection, you're going to have to start thinking about the law in, in different ways. And if they fundamentally believe that this thing is not happening and they're not kind of, it's not shared and they're the notion of like ethically needing, I, I'm not putting you on the spot, should they, but it's just, they're making very consequential decisions based on something that they don't even think is happening. It's just, it would be insanity that they would be able to make a ruling on that. Right. I th and I think that you have to, we have expert agencies, of course, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is afforded some level of deference in their agency decision making. There's open question about how much deference they should be afforded, even amongst this current Supreme Court. But I do think the impact is going to be so great that it's going to be very, very difficult not to wrestle with these with these issues. That's sort of one of the key things I'm trying to point out in the paper is just the future you know, is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And we're seeing that in these legal doctrines. And so I think judges, homeowners, lawmakers, podcasters, all of the above are going to have to start thinking about these really thorny questions sooner rather than later.
Okay, and, and speaking of the Supreme Court, that you know, obviously it's an ideologically conservative court at the moment, and I think you talk about some issues that could go really need to be decided on in the future, and I, I can't think of them right now, but just like some big adaptation decision that the Supreme Court's weighing in on that's going to just be really important, and they weigh in a way that makes it impossible for local governments, state governments to take adaptation actions that are just for everyone. You know, let's say it's even related to managed retreat. It's just, or super empowering eminent domain. They make it impossible. And it just, everyone just sort of shrugging, putting their hands up. We can't do all the things we do for the public safety here. I mean, I guess that could happen though, right? I guess it could happen. So the Supreme court, the current jurisprudence is a bit of a mixed bag as it applies to climate adaptation. On one hand, I mentioned the fifth amendment takings clause, and it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. But the Supreme Court has interpreted the term public use to be relatively large, very, very broad. That includes most environmental protection, most climate adaptation measures. That's following a string of Supreme Court cases that ended in, in Kilo in, in 2005. But the Supreme Court has also found indirect takings, which could be something, uh, an where a flood on, a, on, on one piece of property floods another piece of property. The, the Supreme Court has held that temporary takings could be required just compensation. And so we haven't had sort of this seminal private property moment for climate adaptation yet. But your point is well taken, Doug, about how would the court wrestle this within all these different competing interests in a very complex science? All right. And well, one of the questions that came up very early, even before I finished reading the paper, was just like, if you could just amend the Constitution, what would it look like? And it just it might there might not be a need to amend the Constitution. And you've talked about a lot of precedents. But you do mention in your paper, you have this the idea of a, an amendment that could enshrine a substantive constitutional right to a stable and healthy environment. And I, I think that was the basis of it. Could you elaborate? Sure. And I, let me just be clear that this is the beauty of being an academic talking about right, 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 right. constitutional amendments, which is we have a little bit of gridlock in, in the Congress and of course. in this country to make to understate it. But I think that there could be a climate moment or a climate, I call it a climate constitutional moment at some point, and it could come. And that can come in two forms, Doug. One would be looking at existing laws or existing constitutional provisions such as the due process clause or equal protection clause and finding a constitutional right to a stable and healthy environment. That was an argument that was made in the children's case, Juliana versus the United States, which ultimately failed at, in federal court. But they were saying, look, we have a substantive right to a clean, healthy environment that's enshrined in the constitution and the government has a duty to operationalize and protect that right. So you, using basically the existing text of the constitution and finding a new right. Alternatively, there could be some sort of amendment to the Constitution. And I, I talk a little bit about this in the paper, and I would love to see something done maybe in the regulatory taking space that take into account climate conditions or the notion that rebalancing the, the private public property rights in, in a way that gives local governments, state governments, a little bit more space to take innovative climate adaptation measures. Because right now, I think there could be a chilling effect for fear of, of litigation. I also think you could see state constitutions, a lot of state constitutions discuss protection of environment, protection of a healthy, clean environment. I also see some, some state constitutional work that could be done. That's much more likely to happen just it's easier to get a state constitutional amendment through. But there's some work to be done, I think, at the constitutional level that could help with some of these adaptation efforts. Yeah, it'd be very difficult to get a new amendment, but it, it all, you know, at, that's this moment. I just, you think of what climate change might ultimately mean and the jeopardy that we face, it might change everyone's mind, but we're, we're certainly not in that mindset yet with enough people thinking like that. So related to this, I want to pivot and you have done a ton of writing. You lawyers and your writing, and the volume of work that you've put out, I'm just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, but I want to talk about national emergencies and sort of the executive orders and the ability of president to do something. And it's related to the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court gets makes decisions that makes it impossible to do things, where does the president kind of step in? Does he have even have the legal right? And so there's the National Emergencies Act, and it could address climate change. You talk about this in a paper, and could you elaborate a bit on that? Here's another potential tool the toolkit, right? Sure. So I wrote a paper, Is Climate Change a National Emergency? That's about a year and a half old in the UC Davis Law Review. And essentially asked that question. It was a bit of a thought exercise, Doug, where if the president were to declare 
climate change and national emergency? What would be the legal authority to do that? And what could he or she actually do? And it's interesting. The National Emergencies Act, as you referenced, is authority that Congress has delegated to the president to declare an emergency, which is very, very broadly defined. In fact, it's not defined in the statute. And so right now, we're in some odd 35 emergencies, national emergencies, that, that the president actuates specific powers. And so the National Emergency Act, just by declaring an emergency, sort of serves as a skeleton key, which unlocks certain doors that could be used to address a whole host of issues. So if he was to declare climate change a national emergency, I highlight a few possible things that the president could do. Just also cognizant, this would be enormously controversial right, right. Uh, to, to do this. But I also wanted to have a little bit of a thought exercise to look at what would those powers be and what could possibly be done. And let's just, on the flip side of that, it'd be very controversial if a president is not acting based on what a clear and present danger to the American people, too. I just, you know, have to kind of look at it that way. So it's one of those things you just don't want the president to exploit in a situation that doesn't seem obvious. So, yeah. And I will say, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Joe. I, I think that this potentially was an issue this summer prior to the Inflation Reduction Act. There was a few weeks there where it looked like we weren't going to have much climate legislation. So there was, I think, an open discussion or some, somewhat open discussion about using the National Emergencies Act to declare climate change an emergency. And there actually, we should say, there are some work that could be done that don't implicate civil rights or liberties. And I talk about that in the paper, which I'm sure you'll put in the show notes, which could facilitate some, uh, unpack some more federal funding for green energy, using certain laws to, frankly, punish sort of climate rogue states or, or, or states that are really engaging in egregious climate activities. I use the case of Brazil uh, in the paper itself for the destruction of the rainforest. So there is some work that could be done that doesn't necessarily implicate you know, civil liberties concerns. Whether or not that should be done, I'll leave that to the, the policymakers. But there's certainly authorities that are there. And if you believe climate change is, in fact, an existential crisis, you're going to want to start thinking about all the different legal tools that are in your toolkit. You know, I guess what's scary about that, my knee jerk reaction is like, well, yes, I want the president to kind of step up and work on this. But then you have a new president. They could use the same powers and make an argument that let's build a border wall as part of this climate emergency and all sorts of ways of interpreting to your own political agenda. So it's a Pandora's box if, if you're not done right. You, you would just think <laughs> we wouldn't pass legislation based on rational actors. But that's not how, I guess, democracies work. All right. There's a little commentary there at the end. No, exactly right. And I've been quite critical of the, of the border wall emergency in that uh, context, Doc. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Are any countries doing this well when it comes to legal system reform and such? This paper doesn't necessarily address that. I think that that's something I'm looking at doing in, in further projects. I think one of the things that struck me is just how protective – our constitutional system is a private property rights. And it really took me to, and I've been writing this paper for several years to, to do a deep dive into the law, doctrine, and statutes to look at this. And so I don't know of any other nation that has private property protections like the U.S. does. I think when I look to our neighbors to the north, Canada is doing some interesting work on managed retreat that is worth looking into. I'm potentially looking at doing a comparative study down the line, but Right now, I think that the U.S. is really uniquely situated in the sense that we're the largest greenhouse gas emitter historically in the world. But we also have these private property protections that are encapsulated by the Fifth Amendment that make it challenging for a lot of adaptation that needs to take place. Yeah, our properties. I mean, it's obviously very important for a lot of reasons, but it's, it's it keeps us from making a lot of really good decisions in the public interest. But that that's another episode. And <laughs> We kind of to finish this out, this section out, your experience with the military, I'm curious, how has that helped you in a lot of the work that you're doing now? Sure. So I actually came to this, the climate issue, relatively organically and naturally when I was in the military. I was serving as a Navy JAG in Norfolk, Virginia, and we were looking at adaptation in Norfolk, Virginia, Hampton Roads. Your listeners might be familiar with that part of the world. It's the largest Navy base in the world, probably the largest concentration of national security infrastructure in the whole entire world. And Norfolk 
the seas are rising and the, and the soil is sinking. And so I came to this climate change issue sort of organically when we were thinking about, well, how can we safeguard Norfolk Naval Station in the surrounding area? And that's when I, frankly, this idea, this germ of the paper came about 10 years ago when I was looking at all the property laws in Hampton Roads and on the federal facility and just how difficult of a problem this will be to, to adapt. I think how it's helped me is that I think military planners, and I think I still have this as an academic, very relatively apolitical. We are very much problem solvers. We have a planning culture. We're always trying to plan for the future, very much a risk-based decision-making culture. And so climate change kind of fits snugly in a lot of the training that we have in the military as we start planning for sort of unknown adversaries or unknown risks and making decisions in the face of incomplete knowledge, but you know you have to start planning for the future and making decisions. And so that's been very helpful, I think, as I start thinking about some of these legal challenges that are going to be facing our country in the context of climate adaptation. I also think that there's a whole, and you've had really wonderful guests on this, Doug, on climate security that is gets people people's attention because it's not just an environmental issue or a green issue, but it's actually a, very much a security issue as well. All right. We're going to get you on at some point. We're going to talk national security. We just didn't have time for that in this episode, but it, it's a whole area for you. And I, I certainly want to have that conversation too. I have a lot of uh, younger listeners in the sense of like university students and people that really want to get into the adaptation space. And sometimes they reach out and they ask advice on it and they listen to the podcast and they're getting ideas, be it an urban planner, landscape architect. And so you're there at a, a law program there at Emory. Is there a lot of interest from your law students in climate change or is it just more kind of environmental law? I mean, how does that work with your students? I think the interest is through the roof. I really do, Doug. And I taught climate change law and policy at University of Pennsylvania Law School, and that was standing room only class. And I also would invite not just law students, but other people who are just interested in climate change adaptation or climate change law and policy into the classroom. And so we would get a really interesting group of people, who, uh, students who were, weren't just law students, they were all over the, the university. And same at Syracuse. And I taught that class with environmental economists, political scientists, and ecologists because it's very interdisciplinary. And so we also would have a whole host of students from across the university. And the same here at Emory. I have public health people in my class because it's very, very interdisciplinary in, in, in nature. And I should also say that Emory, I'll, I'll give a plug for Emory <laughs> University. It has a new climate initiative looking at research, scholarship, teaching in the climate space that was just announced a few months ago. And that's really going to bring in a lot of students and interest in this area. But this, to your question, it's through the roof. I didn't have a climate change course when I went to law school 15 uh, some odd years ago, and the students are really, really engaged on this issue. And you might disagree with me here. I, you know, I worked in conservation policy for the longest time, and I worked with a lot of environmental lawyers. And there's a certain type of person that goes into environmental law. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Great that they're out there, right? Maybe they're not taking the big bucks with the corporate law firm because they're doing environmental law. Do you feel like there's actual opportunities that were, when you're thinking about climate adaptation. You don't necessarily have to equate it with environmental law. It could be adaptation law. And I was looking at the different sections of your you know, emphasis at Emory Law and you know, there's health law and there's corporate law and all that. Do you think there's this opportunity where people could actually get into the adaptation law space? And it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're an environmental lawyer. I think that's right. I think that the law helps in the adaptation space because you sort of have the just a baseline of, of legal knowledge to, to work with the policy makers. And so, uh, you know, I think as environmental lawyers, I think the best environmental lawyers when I was in practice are just natural problem solvers. They're not saying no, and they're not saying yes, they're, they're sort of helping the client, whoever that may be, sort of solving problems. And so I think that the lawyers have an important role in doing that. Hopefully that's responsive to your question, Doug. Sort of. Well, maybe this would help go further. And in, in I'm not sure how much as, you know, as an academic now, but, you know, law firms are always, I think they're there talking at the, the law schools. Are, is there interest from law firms when it comes to students or not? Well, I guess lawyers, to, you know, graduate to have some background in climate law? There is. And, and there's climate practice growing at law firms. I had a, a classmate of mine speak to my class on climate change law and policy who is, has a climate practice at a, at a major United States law firm. So that's a growing area. I think I think the Inflation Reduction Act is sort of a game changer on how we implement that law going going forward. So there'd be a lot of work, I think, for for lawyers, not just within federal agencies and state and local governments as you look to operationalize that, but also at law firms. And so tr traditional environmental law, that regulatory practice is always going to be there. But I think the climate practice is, is a growing area. 
Cool. I hope that happens. All right. I'd like to give like concrete takeaways for, for my listeners out there. And you've covered a lot of ground here, but let's say you're a local government person or you're a state government. And what advice would you give them to get better edgy? I mean, I guess they could read your paper, but part of it is just there's needs to be awareness building with people out there making these decisions. What sort of advice would you give people out there to just start looking into the legal implications of all this? Sure. I think that number one would just sort of be familiar with the climate science as you look through your your land use planning, your adaptation planning for the future and make clear as a policymaker, as a legislature, this is why you're making a respective change. I think that you just be clear about the legal challenges that are in front of them. And if you want to resist, here is going to be some of the challenges associated with physical takings. If you want to legislate, here's some challenges associated with accommodation that you need to think through before you actually pass a law, because the number of the dollar amount that is we're talking about here is in trillions of dollars, Doug, associated with just the coastal zone alone exposed to climate impacts. If you're looking at retreat, here are some issues associated with it. Just know that if it's involuntary retreat, it's going to be enormously politically controversial and also very, very expensive associated with paying those homeowners for leaving. But just know that right now we don't really have a clear, coherent national climate adaptation strategy. So the default, I, I argue, and I would say to the policymakers, we're defaulting to what I call unmanaged retreat, which is sort of ad hoc, disjointed, reactive. And that's not a good way to move forward. We need to start thinking forward-looking, prescriptively about dealing with climate risks as we understand them right now. So the, this question, I'm sure my listeners, they've been waiting for this the whole episode, and it's probably the only thing they're really interested in is... What was it like landing a fighter plane on an aircraft carrier? <laughs> it was a lot of fun in the daytime. Okay. And during the nighttime, I will say that it was stressful. <laughs> so that's the best I can do. But it's a it's a young man or woman's game. I'll say that now. You can, if you were looking at me, you'd see my gray hairs. I probably have at least 20 or 30 from each aircraft carrier landing, Doug, but I, it's a, it's a fun job. It was a, it was a, it was a great job, but I'm also really glad to be outside the cockpit in a safer environment. All right. And you saw Top Gun Maverick, right? Of course. I did. Yes. Okay. Twice. Okay. <laughs> all right. So that when he was breaking all those records at the very beginning, when he just ejected, he would have been dead, right? You just don't kind of survive at that speed, right? That's true. That's a true statement. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Just, it's like, all right, I get it's a movie and such. And let's create a little controversy here now is, are we going to have fighter pilots 20 years from now, or is it all going to be drones? I think there will be a ratio of drones to fighter pilots, which is very, very high, but we'll still have manned aircraft, I think, taking off and launching from aircraft carriers and still with the Air Force, but the ratio will be skewed more towards UAVs. All right. Well, I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. Last question. I ask all my guests, if you could recommend one person to come on the podcast, and they don't necessarily have to come on, but it's just sort of your, this kind of aspirational guest that would come on the podcast, who would it be? Sure. I'm a huge admirer. I'm, probably, I'm a huge admirer of all your, your podcast guests, and I could say all the ones I really love. But I, I, I think that Robin Craig would be really great to have on your podcast, Doug, because she's a law professor at University of Southern California. She's been thinking about climate adaptation for, for 30 some odd years. Her wow. work is very, very interesting. She just wrote this really great paper called Four Degrees Celsius, which looks at what are the challenges in adaptation when if the world was to be at the four degrees Celsius level, according to just global aggregate temperatures, she would be a great guest. She's a lovely person. She's incredibly smart. And I cite her all the time in my work. So I think Robin Craig would be really great. Well, maybe you can connect us at some point. That sounds fantastic. Really interesting. Happy to do that. Mark, this is fantastic. This lived up to my ex. I love talking about the law. I haven't done it enough. And I think you're doing some really exciting work. And I think your students that come through your program are probably going to go out and do some amazing things. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Mark for joining the podcast. I've only focused on the legal system a few times, and I love discussing it with people who actually know the law and are thinking about climate change. I really enjoyed when we touched on the topic of climate skepticism in the legal system. It's concerning to think that judges who hold climate skepticism could be making decisions that have significant impacts on climate change policy. While it's important to respect the judicial system and its decision-making processes, it's essential that we have judges who understand the science behind climate change and the severity of its impacts, or at least respect the voice voices of those experts that do when weighing in on these important cases. 
Additionally, it was encouraging to hear that many law students are interested in pursuing climate law as they will undoubtedly play a crucial part in shaping the future of climate policy. As Mark highlighted, the legal system will play a critical role in climate adaptation and we need lawyers who are climate savvy to lead the charge. I've included links to Mark's essays in the show notes. He has a wealth of knowledge and expertise on how the legal system will respond to climate change, and I highly recommend giving his work a read. And finally, I was glad to hear that scene where Tom Cruise went Mach 10 and Top Gun Maverick was nonsense. I wasn't buying it when I saw it, and Mark confirmed my suspicions. Okay, I'm always hearing from listeners that they have started listening to the podcast in the last few months or the last year, and that means they have missed out on a bountiful archive if they haven't poked around at previous episodes. So I'm going to dig in the vault when I can and highlight two previous episodes in case you need some recommendations. In episode 156, Affordable Housing and Climate Change with Lori Showman of Enterprise Community Partners. So Lori came on, and at the time, she was the National Director for Climate Risk Reduction Resilience at Enterprise Community Partners, but now she's working at the White House for a tour. So we discussed affordable housing and climate change, standardized resilience and building codes, what's problematic about the subject of managed retreat, Resilience 21, and a new important FEMA housing policy change. And in episode 116, I hosted frequent guest Dr. Jesse Keenan of Tulane University. Jesse discussed this new research paper on how sea level rise will impact the viability of the 30-year home mortgage, the foundation of much of the home ownership in the United States. We also discussed how local banks are being more aggressive in avoiding risky coastal loans and much more. So definitely take a look in the archive. Okay, does your organization have a powerful and inspiring story of climate change adaptation to share with the world? Imagine showcasing it on a widely acclaimed podcast with a large network of climate and adaptation professionals. America Adapts offers you the perfect platform to tell your story and spread your message to a global audience. By sponsoring an episode, not only will you be sharing your story with the world, but you will also be incorporating a podcast episode as part of your organization's long-term communication strategy. Don't limit your communication toolkit to just webinars and white papers. They can be dry and forgettable. You'll get to work with me personally to identify the experts that represent the amazing work you're doing. Give your organization a dynamic and engaging way to communicate with members, board members, and funders. Make a lasting impact by using the power of podcast storytelling to captivate your audience and bring your message to life. Some of my previous partners include Battelle, Natural Resources Defense Council, University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard University, to name just a few. So discover the enduring value of podcasts as they continue to promote your story long after its original release. Learn more by emailing me at americadabs at gmail.com. And are you looking for a speaker who can inspire your audience with real-life stories of climate adaptation? Look no further. I offer keynote presentations that weave together engaging stories from the America Adapts podcast and my own experiences in this exciting field. My talks are sure to motivate and inspire your audience. Whether you're planning a public or corporate event, I'm available to speak and share my expertise. Don't miss out on this opportunity to learn about climate adaptation in a fun and informative way, I like to think. To book me as a speaker, visit americadapts.org and get in touch. And as host of America Daps, I'm always eager to connect with my listeners and hear feedback on the show. Whether you want to share your thoughts or suggest a guest you'd like to hear from, I'm open to it all. Your input not only helps me improve the show, but it can also lead to exciting new opportunities. So don't hesitate. Get in touch with me, americadaps at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.